So, um, first of all, thank you, thank you all for coming. Um, I just want to say a few words about what we are doing. Um, the seminars that Matthew and I are saying we are organising, they are informal. Um, the idea is to cover um, some aspects of mathematical finance. Well, today's talk is get, kind of going to be more about the business. Um, Saeed is an expert in foreign exchange. He's worked in foreign exchange for many years um, in various capacities, um, including um, research, quantitative and uh, macroeconomic, and also trading. So he has a lot of experience in um, high frequency trading in particular. Um, and um, he's been running strategies at uh, Lehman Brothers in their works in Europe. Um, so he knows a great deal about foreign exchange. And today's talk is not going to be as much about mathematics. Um, perhaps you, if, if you've been to Matthew's talk, when he, he was talking about pricing options, um, next talk is going to be about pricing interest rate derivatives using graphical pricing units. Uh, well, and we, we, we tend, but we tend to sort of mix. I mean, we have maths, we have um, you know, you know, basic maths, we have financial maths, and we have today a very interesting talk for all of those who want to know about foreign exchange as an asset class, um, about spot and um, options, about uh, volatility, um, and how it's traded, and, and, and you know. It's going to be a very interesting talk, and I'm not going to. Uh, just one more thing: we are going to be collecting eight pounds per person, uh, as, as I said in the website, just to cover the costs. We're not non-profit; we're not making money out of it, but just to, just for the venue uh, and, and everything, we need to kind of break even. So, but other than that, um, I think I don't want to delay this any further. So, Sage is going to start his talk now. Has <laughs> anyone uh, not got a hand up? Yeah, well, uh, I guess Paul introduced me, so I work at uh, Nomura in foreign exchange, and I'm basically a quantitative strategist, so I work on uh, building trading models. I'll, I'll start basically by giving my talk. Um, the main things we're going to cover in this talk are essentially looking at stuff like which, which are the major currencies, um, how are they quoted, uh, what are the most liquid crosses, as in which crosses are traded the most. Um, we're also going to give a description of how FX options are quoted as well. And also what to look for if you're trading FX. One thing to note about the foreign exchange market is actually quite a big market. Uh, in terms of turnover, the figures I've got from uh, the BIS who do a survey every three years from 2007 is that the volume is around $3.5 trillion. And during some of these uh, past few months, uh, it's actually gone up. Um, in, in the beginning of this year, though, it's expected to go down. There's, there are going to be fewer players in the market because lots of hedge funds and other investors, and obviously banks, have gone under. So there's going to be fewer participants in the marketplace. Uh, the most well-known uh, asset in FX is FX spot. So that's basically just buying a currency or selling a currency for media delivery. And it's settled usually in uh, one day or two days, depending on which currency pair it is. Uh, and that's around a trillion dollars turnover every day. Uh, then we have FX forwards, outright FX forwards. So there you're, basically, you're essentially buying and selling currencies for delivery at a later date. For example, one week, or one month, or one year. Um, and that's a smaller market, it's around $350 million. Uh, sorry, Billy. That's a mistake there. It's definitely not um, And also we have FX swaps, which is essentially a combination of a spot trade and a forward trade. So, for example, what you might do is you might uh, go short, you might sell spots and then buy a forward. So, typically in a financial institution, if you have a, a spot trade, you don't actually hold the balances overnight. What, uh, what will happen is your balances will be rolled to the next day using a swap contract. So it's not like in a bank where you actually have uh, an account. So they will actually roll that for you every day of swap transaction. And then we also have FX options. So this is similar essentially to options in other asset classes. So it will 
uh, option contract will give you the right to, for example, to buy a currency at a specific price and at a specific date. Um, that's, a, that's as simple as form. Um, but there are lots of different options and I'll go on to them at a later point. Um, in terms of where foreign exchange is traded, the most uh, common place where it's traded is the UK. So around 34% of all transactions have uh, one counterparty in the UK. Uh, then you have uh, the US, mainly in, in New York, and that's 17%. And in Asia, you have uh, the major centers is Tokyo and Singapore. So they're around 6% each. And in Europe, you also have uh, Switzerland as a major center. So for example, one of the major market makers, UBS, is actually the uh, market maker in uh, Zurich, so they operate out there. And you also have other centres, for example, uh, Frankfurt is another centre as well. I guess everyone knows which are the major currencies. Uh, obviously, dollar is the most important currency. Most uh, most transactions involve the dollar. But there are lots of other different currencies. Um, the ones which are traded the most are collectively known as the G10. So we have, first of all, Euro, which is around... Uh, which is involved in around 37% of the transactions. And all these figures are quoted for a double because each uh, currency trade will involve two different uh, currencies. So we have Euro, which is around 37%. Then we have uh, Sterling, which is 15%. Then we have Aussie, which is Australian dollar, that's around 6.7%. Then we have Kiwi, which is uh, New Zealand dollar, which is about 1.9%. Then we obviously have US dollar, which we just call the dollar, which is 86%. Then we have CAD, which is Canadian dollar. Some people also call this the loonie. I've not worked out why, but that's one of the other terms for CAD. Uh, then we have Swiss, which is around 7%, and that's the Swiss franc. Then we have uh, Noki, which is around 2%, that's Norwegian krona. Uh, then we also have Stocky, which is Swedish Krona. I'm assuming people call it Stocky, so it rhymes with Noki. So then if you want to trade uh, Noki against Stocky, it becomes Noki Stocky. <laughs> Some people call it Sec as well, but I think they're generally people that are not involved in the market. So. Um, and we also have Yen, which is around 16% Japanese Yen. Uh, the reason I've written them in this order is this is a quotation order. So if you're quoting Euro against Yen, it will always be one euro is so many yen, so euro yen. And similarly, if you want to trade, for example, dollar against Norwegian krona, that will be dollar noki. So one dollar is so many Norwegian krona. Uh, and on the whole, in these crosses, uh, the dollar crosses tend to be traded the most. Uh, so if we want to trade euro, commonly we'll trade euro dollar. If you want to trade yen, it will be dollar yen. Similarly, if you want to trade uh, sterling, it will generally be uh, sterling against dollar. And that cross has a special name, which is cable, for the transatlantic cable. Um, but certain crosses are traded against the euro as a primary cross. So the, the Scandinavian cross is basically Noki and Stocky will be traded against euro. So when they're quoted, they tend to be quoted euro, Noki, and euro, Stocky. Um, but even though these the dollar crosses are the primary ones traded, you can trade any different combination. <coughs> so you could trade, for example, here, Aussie Kiwi. So then you would trade Aussie dollar and Kiwi dollar in one transaction. And the market maker would basically transact two crosses on your behalf. But because of that, it's going to cost you more because they've got to do two different trades for you. Uh, and in terms of liquidity, uh, the crosses which are traded most are uh, Euro Dollar, which is about 27%. Then we've got Dollar Yen, which is the second, around 13%. Uh, cable, which is 12%. Uh, Aussie Dollar, which is 6%. Uh, dollar Swiss, which is 5%. And we've got Dollar Cow, which is 4%. And Dollar Stocky, which is 2%. And we've also got some other Euro crosses. Euro Yen is actually quite liquid as well. Uh, in terms of crosses, that's around 2%. Euro sterling is also traded quite a bit. Euro Swiss. But those aren't obviously the only currencies, although those are the ones which are traded the most. Um, so
So it tends to be with emerging market currencies, they're also traded against the dollar on the whole, except for the ones in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, there is a complication with some emerging market currencies because you can't actually uh, trade them directly. So you can't actually take possession of, for example, Brazilian real if you're a foreign investor. So the only way to trade them as a foreign investor is through a non-deliverable forward. So this, this contract is basically going to be a forward, but at the end of it, you don't actually get any emerging market currency, you just get it settled in dollars. So you'll, you'll basically make a profit on dollars, and that's what you will get at the end of the contract. You won't actually at any point hold that currency, which is, kind of, which is different. If you were local, for example, trading in Brazil, you would actually be able to trade FX spot there. Uh, but as an outside investor, you can't. Uh, the idea is they don't. They want to try and reduce the volatility in their currency, which might have a, an effect on their economy. And lots of these uh, currency controls came into effect after 1998, when there was the Asian crisis. And lots of Asian currencies uh, sold off considerably. So they thought it would be a better idea to have the currency controls. Um, and this gives rise to the fact that lots of currencies in EM are pegged. So the central bank is only going to allow the trade within a specific range. If it goes above the range, then the central bank will start selling. Or if it goes below the range, the central bank will start buying. Um, other currencies will trade within specific bands that the central bank is defined as well. Um, but even if currencies aren't pegged or aren't managed in this systematic fashion, you can have central banks intervening to influence the exchange rate. So even in G10 currencies, you might have uh, current, uh, countries at the beginning. So for example, I think last year, uh, the RBNZ, which is a central bank of New Zealand, intervened in the market uh, to uh, stop the appreciation of the uh, New Zealand uh, dollar. So here I've just given the major currencies that traded in the emerging markets. Um, in Latin America, uh, we've got uh, Mex, which is Mexican peso. Then we've got uh, Brazil, which is Brazilian real. Then we've got Chile, which is a uh, Chilean peso. Then we've got COP, which is uh, Colombian peso. Um, and then in Eastern Europe, uh, Middle East and Africa, we've got uh, we've got Poland, which is Polish zloty. We've got Czech, which is Czech corona. Then we've got Huff, which is Hungarian florin. And these ones tend to be traded against Euro because lots of their trade is with the Euro anyway. So it kind of makes more sense to be trading against the Euro. And then we've got other currencies um, in Africa and also Europe and the Middle East. And we've got Rand, which is uh, one of the most volatile currencies. And we've got a Ruble. And we've also got uh, Turkey as well. Um, we've got Shekel, which is Israeli Shekel. And uh, we've got uh, Icelandic Krona ISK. But ISK is not really traded as much grain now because after that, this is a currency kind of blew up a bit like what's happening to Sterling at the moment, but, but on a, like a much bigger basis. Um, and in Asia, we've got uh, Hong Kong dollars. And Hong Kong dollars is, is pegged within a very tight band with the dollar. We've also got Korea, which is Korean won. Uh, we've also got India, which is Indi Indian rupee. I think with emerging markets, people aren't original about their nicknames, they just call it the country, as opposed to the currency. Then we've got China, and we've got Taiwan dollar, and we've got Singh, which is Singapore. Uh, we've got Malays Malaysian ringgit, um, and we've got uh, Indonesian rupee as well. So mo most of the Asian currencies are actually non-deliverable, so I've starred those currencies here. And uh, also in Latin America, most of them are starred as well. So Brazil, Chile, Colombian peso are also starred. Yeah. Um, can I ask a question? Yes, yeah, sure. I, just, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Okay. okay. So suppose I'm a trader, I'm working for um, a Brazilian oil company, yeah. and I want to sell, um, I don't know, 100 barrels or 100,000 barrels of oil to Venezuela in yeah. six months' time. Um, how will I use a non deliverable forward? I'm just trying to sort of get an idea of how, how these things are used. And, well, I guess there you would have a difference because as a speculator you don't deliver you don't deliver even the currency. So there you probably wouldn't want to use an NDF, you'd have to trade locally. Right. Uh, because if your main objective is to actually get the currency, then a non-deliverable forward is not going to be the right way of doing it. 
At least at things I'm not an expert on in here, so I think it's the right answer. <laughs> so, but there, there must be some way of getting the currency delivered. Otherwise, then, so for example, Brazilian companies couldn't operate outside outside their jurisdiction. Um, I guess in terms of terminology, FX is uh, leveraged uh, investment. So if you've got, say, a uh, million dollars, then you could, for example, leverage that up and trade actually $10 million of notional. So the idea is if you actually start trading, that million dollars will just be collateral. So if you start losing money, your, best, your profit and loss will be taken out of that margin. And if you lose, if you lose 10% of your $10 million and your margin is finished, that's it, your market maker will basically close up your positions and you can clean that. So hopefully it won't get to that, but that's, that's what happens. Um, obviously, the more you borrow, the more risk it is. So in terms of the leverage, uh, you shouldn't put excessive amount of leverage because um, if you start trading that way, you'll end up absorbing all the losses and not being able to make any money. So unless you're very lucky and keep on making money repeatedly, then you'll be cleaned out from your positions. Um, and in terms of terminology, if you're going long Europe, that means that you're essentially, basically the trade is similar to selling, borrowing dollars, selling that, and buying euros. So that's what you'd be doing as a speculator if you're going long euro or dollar. Um, and similarly, if you're going short euro or dollar, it would mean that you're borrowing euros, selling that, buying dollars. But it's done in such a way that you don't actually need to have a euro bank account, you don't need to have a dollar bank account, you just need to have uh, an account with a market maker who will essentially give you spot positions and you roll that on a daily basis. So if you're long euro dollar, You'll, you'll lose money if the euro de depreciates against the dollar. And if you're shorted, then you'll, you'll gain against the euro, strengthening against the dollar. Is that the idea? Yeah, so if you're short euro dollar and euro weakens, yeah. then you'll make money. Yeah. If you're long euro dollar and euro strengthens, you'll make money. There's also the interest rate differential. Yeah, there's also the interest rate differential. When, when your spot position is rolled overnight, if it, you'll basically make money or lose money depending on the interest rate differential. So if you're long euro dollar, and that implies that overnight when you roll your position, you'll be long euro and short dollar. So if the euro interest rate is higher than dollar interest rate, you'll make money on that roll. So if, if the exchange rate were to stay totally static, in one year's time, a long euro dollar position would probably make money because dollar rates are between 0 and 0.25 and euro rates I think about between 1 and 2 percent. So if they stayed static, the exchange rate would actually make over a percent on your on your position. That's because inflation is different in European area to the to the US. This, this is the carry trade. Yes, yeah, it's a carry trade basically. So, so basically you're making money on interest rate differential because the rates that the ECB set in the market yeah. React to a higher than what the Fed rates are. <coughs> so, according to the interest rate differential, the currency should appreciate or differ, will appreciate yeah. in line with the interest rate differential. If they don't, then you can make money by investing in the currency with a higher interest rate. Yeah. The, the only risk is that if the higher interest rate currency depreciates, then you're stuck. So, um, so, for example, if you were investing in, uh, if you're going to be short dollar Turkey, for the past few years, um, you'd have made quite a bit of money on carry, but then last year you lost money because Turkish lira sold off quite heavily. Just, so, just, just yeah. wanted to, to say very quickly, even when you say we'll talk about options later on, but I mean the difference in twist that you have, so compared to more of that, we have two interest rates, right? you're looking at the difference between the interest rates, and that's really what drives your option, the, the interest rate is very yeah, like, I guess if you look at equities, in equities you have the, the risk-free rate, you have a dividend yield. So maybe one way to think of it is like that. I, I have a dumb question. Yeah. Where, where do the rates come from? Well, in terms of, well, what do I mean that there are half a dozen different interest rates? Well, basically what will happen is you'll have, I guess you have the base rate set by, say, ECB and the Fed, 
and then the market will follow that. Um, but sometimes there can be a big gulf between what the market does and what the base rate is. Um, and it also depends on short-term pressures, like when you're rolling your spot position, it will be an overnight rate. Okay. So, so that's going to be different to, for example, a one-year forward rate. Right? So could those rates be different depending on which market they come in? They might just be slightly different. Okay. And also, for example, before a big event, they might go up as well. Or before a weekend as well, people maybe have will trouble will change their rates as well. So, um, and also, if you have uh, an exchange rate like euro dollar, to get, for example, dollar against euro, you just do one over the exchange rate. So if you if you have one euro, so many dollars, you just do say one over one point two eight to get to that other way around. And you can also do you can also combine rates. Um, so, for example, euro yen is approximately equal to euro dollar multiplied by dollar yen, and at pretty much nearly every time scale that will be true. But occasionally, at very low level time scales, you might have slight differences. But usually, they get tend to get removed by people in the market who are basically just doing that, trying to explore the differences between the different exchange rates. So, do you mean when there's not much trading going on, when it's in a liquid market, and they can get some differences? No, I'm saying at the very lowest level, for example, if you split up the time like tick by tick, okay. then you might get slight okay. differences. Okay. But if you're, if you're just looking like at the screen, it'd be very difficult to find any differences. So, um, because I guess people with very high phrase fast data connections will be developing systems specifically to, yeah. to, like, to remove this from the market. So by the time they've removed it, you probably see the, uh, see the difference. I guess in terms of liquidity, when people trade the most, it's mostly going to be during London hours, because in London morning you've also got Asia open, and then in London afternoon you've also got New York open, so it's kind of a time zone thing. Um, so the most liquid part of the market, for G10 currencies at least, is between around 12 p.m. to around 4 p.m. London, because around 4 p.m. London, when people start to move their books to New York, and people start to go home. Maybe not as much now, go home at four, but <laughs> before maybe. Um, it also depends upon local markets as well. For example, if you want to trade um, Asian currencies, usually you only get liquidity in Asian time. So you're going to have real difficulty if you want to execute, for example, a Korea trade in New York time, because you are, you'll basically have no market. So when the market maker quotes you a, a, a uh, basically gives you a quote will have a very wide spread because he doesn't he basically doesn't know where the market is it's very difficult to know where the market is so to allow for that they'll actually charge you more for your, for your trade and also for example scandies are liquid during Asian time as well so scandies are only going to be liquid as in European hours and to a lesser extent maybe during New York hours as well. um, if you've got liquidity in the market also makes it more difficult to uh, to put big amounts into the market and it also make the spreads wider for example with the Asian case and it also depends from currency to currency for example if you want to trade 20 million euro dollar you can probably execute that at any any point of the day without any problem but if you want to execute say 20 million and uh, say I stand the corona you're going to have real difficulty trying to execute that. That, that. that was even when the market was good for us and Corona. And even for emerging market currencies, well, if you want to execute large amounts of, say, Turkey or something. Um, but I guess if you're doing this for, re for like, retail trading, like, unless you're doing something wrong, hopefully you're not going to come up against that barrier. So. Um, I guess if you look at the market, it's going to be open 20, 24 hours from Sunday evening till uh, uh, Friday evening New York time. And then it will be closed during the weekend. And it's important to say that the recent market turmoil, turmoil has reduced liquidity. So it's actually costing more to execute now than it did before. Because there's less, there's less volume, for example, in the past few months. Uh, one thing 
to know about FX is not everyone's an FX speculator. There are lots of people who have to trade FX because it's part of their job. Um, for example, corporations will need to repatriate profits to their home country. Um, investors might also be buying assets in other countries, for example, setting up factories. They'll also need to get local currency. Also, in terms of tourism, they'll also need to, to get foreign currency. Uh, governments also trade uh, FX as well. Um, for example, central banks, which are, which are generally, they're, they're part of the government, but they should also be independent in many cases. Um, I guess that's a difficult question, that one, if they're independent or not. Um, they will also intervene in the market, as mentioned before, sometimes to weaken a currency, sometimes to strengthen a currency. For example, uh, the Russian Central Bank have been trying to intervene recently to try and support the ruble. But, uh, re but the thing is it wasn't working as much as they expected. So then they started to let it depreciate slowly in the ruble. So they didn't want to use up all their reserves essentially defending their currency. So in many cases what it will do is it will essentially slow a move as opposed to turning it. Also, uh, as mentioned before, uh, G10 current uh, countries have also intervened in the markets before. For example, RBNZ, a couple of years ago, the Bank of Japan also intervened. Um, because in Japan, it's a major exporter. So when the yen strengthens considerably, uh, like now, for example, it can cause problems in terms of uh, the exporters. Because obviously, their their exporters going to have a lot more difficulty selling their assets abroad. Um, and also, central banks will try and diversify their currency reserves. For example, they might not want to hold it all in dollars. Um, so you've seen lots of current, uh, countries trying to diversify into other currencies, for example, euro and so sterling. So if, there's a, if the dollar does depreciate significantly, their reserves don't uh, depreciate as much. And obviously we'll also have speculators, so we'll have hedge funds, uh, retail investors, uh, banks, I guess ex-investment banks, and also commercial banks. Um, banks tend to be more essentially market makers, so they're trying to offer liquidity to investors. But they will also take positions as well where they think the currency is going to go. So here we talk about market makers. Um, their job is to provide liquidity, so if, you're, if you ring them up as a hedge fund, they're supposed to offer you a price without offering you a massive spread. Um, so if you want to buy a currency or sell a currency cross, they will, they will let you execute that trade, essentially. Um, and that's different, so as, as an investor you'd be a market taker, so you're taking liquidity out of the market. So they're offering you a price and you can choose to execute at that price or not at that price. Whereas when the market make the market maker is actually giving a price, so it's slightly, two slightly different things. And the market maker will try and make uh, money on the spread. So if they can match two trades, uh, they can pocket the difference. But um, sometimes it's not as simple as that because you might have a one-sided market. So as a market maker it makes it kind of, it makes it more difficult then. Because you'll have everybody trying to go into one side, so you can't. It's more difficult to match off trades than as the market is moving. Um, FX is mostly traded over the counter, so there doesn't tend to be an exchange. Um, some futures are traded on exchanges, such as the, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. FX tends to be a, quite a commoditized product in that it's very high volume, at least for G10 FX. So your spreads are very small. So for example, for euro dollar, you might have one or two pips, which is probably a lot better than you get for most stocks, just because of the, the massive amount of liquidity. Um, so the aim of the, the market maker is basically, because they've got such high volumes, they're trying to get as high vo volume as possible uh, to make money, because if they had low volume and tight spreads, they wouldn't really make that much money. And in terms of the FX market, one of the major attractions to investors who want to trade it is that um, you have very high liquidity. So if you enter into a position, for example, in Eurodollar, you can very easily exit it without any problems. 
if you're holding a liquid asset, for example, like mortgage-backed security, which lots of banks are holding, if you want to exit that trade, it's going to be very difficult. You might have to take a loss as well. And people might not even want to show you prices as market makers. Um, and in terms of, like, of, in terms of communication between market makers, uh, you have interbank FX brokers who will try and match trades between market makers. And you also have interbank electronic platforms such as Reuters and EBS, which market makers can use to trade between themselves. There are lots of things which influence exchange rates. Um, probably the most important, or, or one of the major factors, are fundamental issues. Uh, one is interest rates. Um, as interest rates go higher in a country that tracks overseas capital, as people are trying to chase a uh, higher yield, and also as interest rates uh, increase, it generally tends to be indicative that the economy is doing better. That, does, that doesn't always work because sometimes interest rates are high because of inflation and you've got poor growth, for example, and that's called like a stagflation scenario. So it's not a blanket rule that higher interest rates are necessarily good for an economy or a sign of a healthy economy. And certainly in emerging markets, I don't think people look upon hiking interest rates as being a good sign. They generally tend to be hiked in the past because of inflation. Although that, that's changing over time. And as Adam mentioned, we also have the carry trade, where people try and take advantage of the, the carry differential between two currencies. So for example, if you go long uh, Turkish lira, the, the interest rate in Turkey is over 10%. And if you went short dollars, which is around 0%, you'd make 10% on that, provided there was no movement in the exchange rate. So you, you basically have to run the gauntlet of, uh, of Turkish lira selling off there. And, but also, if Turkish lira strengthens, you'll also make money on the spot change as well, as the carrier. Also, we look at the economic situation in terms of uh, measuring that through economic releases. Uh, one of them is current account. So looking at how much uh, money uh, a country is borrowing. For example, the UK has a very uh, negative current account, whereas Japan has a positive current account. So that can be one explanation as to why sterling has sold off so much in the past few months, versus, for example, yen, which is perceived more of a, of a low risk or safe haven currency. Um, but equally, current countries with a very uh, negative current account have to hike rates to attract overseas capitals. Uh, overseas capital, so it's not it's not a blanket rule. So it just depends on the general market situation. If people, if the market tends to be uh, risk averse, then they'll then they'll flock to things like the current account. When people want to put on more risk, they'll go into uh, trades such as the carry trade. Um, also, another uh, important indicator is GDP. Uh, essentially measuring the output of an economy and how it's changed over time. And in most uh, major industrialized countries, that's negative. So that essentially meaning that we're in recession at the moment. So what you tend to have is a sort of ugly contest, which, uh, which currency is worse than the other, and then you then trade in relative value. Um, also, we have inflation, which is a pass through into where interest rates might go. Also, unemployment, obviously high unemployment, is indicative of a, of a weakening economy. And there are lots of other economic indicators. Some are, some are more forward-looking, which is surveys. For example, you might have a, the ISM survey in the United States, which looks at, for example, you might have ISM for service sector, ISM for manufacturing. And the ISM is basically a survey between 0 and 100. And values above 50 are indicative of, uh, of industry basically growing going forwards, and values below 50 are indicative of uh, people expecting falls going forward. So people tend to look at surveys as being more forward looking, whereas obviously measures such as GDP will be for a previous quarter. They also tend to be lagged. Um, in terms of uh, employment data, 
one of the ones which people look at is, uh, is non-farm payrolls, which is released roughly on the first Friday of every month uh, in the US. And the reason they look at that is that's generally the first day to release out of the US for the new month. Um, the recent data release has been pretty poor for non-farm payrolls. I think the last one was minus 600,000 jobs. But when people trade them, they'll look at the difference between the actual uh, data release and also expectations. So although minus 600,000 was a, obviously a bad number, it wasn't too far from expectations, it was around minus 550. Uh, we also look at terms of trade effects, which is looking at the value of exports versus the value of imports of a certain economy. Uh, for example, for Norway, uh, one of its major exports is oil. So when oil goes up in price, that's a positive terms of trade effect for Norway. So we might expect that, for example, Nor Norwegian uh, krona might strengthen if oil is strengthening the price. And one thing I mentioned earlier is the state of the market, just general investor sentiment. If, if, if the market is essentially selling off and people are very risk averse, then they'll flock to currencies which are going to be more, uh, in their opinion, more stable currencies which will have uh, a current account surplus, for example, and also maybe going forward have better economic indicators. Again, this is not a, a general rule because Japanese yen has had very poor data recently, but people have still bought it. So because of more of a safe haven effect rather than taking a view upon Japan's economy is going to do better than, say, the UK or the US. So I guess the main thing is to have a look at lots of different factors and then try to iron out which ones are the ones the market is looking at at a specific point. And, and even better than that, trying to forecast in the next six months where you think uh, the market is going to be looking. And another way is also trying to forecast these variables as well, which is what economists do for these. Um, you also have people that are trading uh, FX looking at technical factors. Uh, one way of trading is momentum trading. So you'll essentially try to buy into a trend. And probably in the past few months, that's probably worked relatively well. So you've had very strong trends in markets. But going before that, you might have lost money because markets were ranging. Um, in terms of ranging markets, people tend to look at mean reversion. So essentially, instead of buying on a strong trend, actually selling, expecting the trend to come back. Uh, and the technique is trying to identify which market you're in. Are we in a ranging market or are we in a, like a trending market? It's, it's usually obvious going back, say, looking at a chart, say, three months ago and saying, yeah, we were definitely in a trending market. But it's more difficult looking at it going forward. And also in terms of uh, chart, people tend to look at charts as well. And they will try and identify certain areas where, for example, prices come down and then bounced. And then they will consider that as an area of resistance. So if the price actually goes through there, people expect it to go a lot further down. Um, and equally, if it bounces off there, then expect it to bounce upwards. But that's more, that's more of a qualitative thing. So you might get three or four people looking at the same chart, and three or four people saying different things on the chart. But obviously, if enough people come to the same conclusion, and you sort of looked at it first, then you'll make a point. So lots of people do tend to look at charting, although it's something that I'm trying to look at myself, but it, I think it takes just experience trying to identify those turning points. This is what they call technical analysis. Yeah, technical analysis, basically. So it's done on the basis of consensus. If enough people predict the same thing, then that trend must be correct. Well, I guess so, because if they, the, those people also have capital and put it into a trade, then it's so the opposite. Perhaps. Yeah, basically. Because there's, there's no actual reason why a, a currency should go up in price, just because you look at a chart. It's only going to go up if everyone thinks, yeah, this is a strong trend. That's buy into it. But equally you, you can look at systematic, you can maybe like build algorithms like moving averages and say whenever it crosses a moving average you buy or whenever it's we 
sell. And then these types of strategies, or actually any type of strategy, you want to build a big portfolio. You don't want to just be trading, for example, euro dollar. Or you don't want to just be trading euro uh, dollar yen. You want to be trading a, a variety of different currency pairs. So if there is something unexpected in a specific market, you're not going to end up with heavy losses. Because lots of the times there might be some idiosyncratic event which affects one particular currency, and you want to reduce that. Um, also, we've got the last slide which talks about FX options. It's probably a bit too uh, small presentation to give too much detail on FX options, only one slide. But um, I'll, I'll try to give a bit of detail. In terms of how FX options are quoted, it's different to what you might have read in other books, for example, the whole book. Uh, in equities, traders will quote you a price for a specific option. So for a specific expiry and a specific strike, they'll give you a price. In FX, it's different. What they will do is, on the whole, they will quote you implied volatilities. And then from that, you actually calculate the price. And they will typically quote you different volatility curve for several different tenants. Uh, overnight options, one week, one month, three months, six months, one year. Um, and they will quote you several different uh, volatilities at each, uh, at each tenor. First of all, they'll quote you the at the money uh, strike. And then they'll quote you the 10 delta 20 and 25 delta risk reversals. So this is basically quoting you the strike that would be equal to 10 delta and 25 delta. And roughly the 25 delta risk reversal is the implied volatility of a 25 delta call minus the implied volatility of a 25 delta put. It's slightly confusing because then you've got to work out the strikes from that. You've got to infer them from where the delta is. And so, so, can you remind me what delta is? Del delta is just the sensitivity of the option price when you have a move in the currency yeah. or the underlying asset. Yeah. So if you buy a call, that will give you the um, will give you the the option to buy a currency at a certain price in the future, which is a, generally quoted above the strike. Yeah. It's not the partial B or the partial S. Yeah. So sensitivity is stock. If you're quoting, if, if the FX options are quoted in implied bonds and not by prices in the equity markets, yeah. then why are you interested in Delta? Sure, you're interested in Vegas, the sensitivity respect to the bonds, and so you want the Vega hedge your book of FX options uh, because basically bonds is your price and is your indicator. I think it's just a convention read, and right. you, you still have the mapping to the price. That's yeah, you yeah. you but you, you, you can you can you can calculate your vega from that. So basically, what what you'll do is you'll uh, first of all you're trying to get your strike back from the delta, and then once you've got your strike back from the delta, you know what the implied volatility of that specific delta is, and then from that you can quote, you can find the option price, or you can calculate your vega or any other. So the, the idea is basically to create a vol surface from all these different quotes and then you can pick any point on that vol surface within strike or tenor space and then get a price for that option. Except maybe at the extremes, your uh, traders might quote slightly different prices at extremes, for example like a 5 delta or a 1 delta. So they, they might not give you exactly the price that's on that surface, just to, to, to basically just to guide them. Um, okay, so I must be missing something here. So you, you get the implied vol. Don't you just plug the implied vol into the back shoulder equation and get the price? Yeah, that's basically. And then yeah. you just take, you just know, so then you just know what the delta is. It's just just the habit, I suppose, in the market to, yeah. to look at the implied vol. So if you, yeah. you know, the old stem balls, 10%, ten, ten percent. Right? I mean, that's, that's, that's the lingo. Right. I think that one reason I was told that it's like this is because FX moves so fast so that you don't need to keep on quoting a new implied volatility every time spot moves. I don't know if that's really the case why it is. And the other is I suppose the sticky delta, sticky, sticky strike, sticky money. Yeah, so, so basically your, your, your smile will move when spot 
generated. Any, any big questions? 